Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining today's webinar hosted by the NOAA Central Library. The library's seminar program provides an educational forum for the presentation of ideas, research, updates, and news in support of NOAA's mission. I'm Katie, and I'm excited to invite you to our NOAA commissioned officer presentation. Sorry, I read the slide and then I fumbled my words. Uh, so first off, logistics. Please note this presentation is being recorded and your name, email, and the questions you ask will be shared with the presenters after the fact. As an attendee, you are muted, so please place all of your questions in the question panel. Questions uh, will be asked throughout, uh, so don't worry about when you put your question in, we'll take pauses and ask them as we go. Uh, and if we don't get to your question, we will ask it at the end. If you are having any technical issues, such as no audio or visuals, please try logging off and back on to GoToWebinar. That solves most issues. Uh, so to start, I'm happy and excited to introduce you to Lieutenant Connor McGinn and Lieutenant Dustin Picard, who will be going over to what uh, the NOAA Corps is, what NOAA's commissioned officers do. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dustin to kick us off. All righty, great. Thank you, Katie. Um, good afternoon, everybody on the line, and, and good morning to those that are in different time zones. As Katie mentioned, my name is Lieutenant Dustin Picard, and I've got a quick introductory slide. Um, I've been uh, with the NOAA Corps now for about eight years. I previously got a general marine science degree at the University of Maryland and shortly joined the Corps thereafter. Um, I graduated from BOTC 122 and actually funny enough, Lieutenant Connor McGinn, my partner today, he is one of my classmates. Uh, my first assignment was aboard the NOAA ship Ronald H. Brown, which is NOAA's flagship research vessel. Uh, I then transitioned to my first land assignment at Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary down in Galveston, Texas, where I earned um, simultaneously went out and earned a master's degree at A&M Galveston. Um, I then reported to my next sea assignment aboard a fisheries research vessel, the NOAA ship Gordon Gunter, and have recently transitioned to my current position as the recruiting, uh, one of the field recruiters here at NOAA Corps Recruiting Branch in Silver Spring, Maryland. Um, so that's a little bit about me. I'd like to turn it over to Connor for his introductions. Sure. Good afternoon and good morning, everyone. My name is Lieutenant Connor McGinn. I am a pilot with the NOAA Aircraft Operations Center. Uh, long ago, eight years ago, I uh, finished a degree in geology from Bates College in Lewiston, Maine, and quickly made my way to BOTC 122 alongside Lieutenant Picard. I served on the NOAA ship Nancy Foster out of Charleston, South Carolina for a couple years. I did a brief uh, tour at the National Weather Service headquarters um, as a special assistant there. And then I went to initial flight training down in Vero Beach, Florida, uh, where I worked through all of my licenses and all my ratings. And then I made it to NOAA's Aircraft Operations Center, also known as AOC in Lakeland, Florida, where I've been ever since. There I'm a twin otter aircraft commander and instructor pilot, so I fly low and slow, close to the ground, looking at whales, seals, dolphins, sea lions, things like that, which we'll talk about later on in the presentation. I also instruct a lot of our uh, pilots that come over from training and work them through their aircraft commander syllabus. And right now I work for the uh, Remote Sensing Division, which is under the Geodetic Survey and the National Ocean Service as a program manager for the flight program there. Uh, and I will focus on the flight aspect of being a NOAA Corps officer later in the presentation. Back to you, Dustin. Thank you, Connor. Uh, so as Connor mentioned, he is an aviator on that side of the house, and I have been a mariner for my entire career. So we'll kind of tag team this presentation as we go along, kind of focus on each of our disciplines. But I'd like to open up uh, with just some general introduction about what the NOAA Corps is, a little bit of background about our history of a service, as well as prereqs and kind of the benefits of our service before we talk uh, about our career. We're going to kind of go over the general career tracks, both Mariner as well as aviation, and then talk about a little personal anecdotes from our career and, um, and kind of um, talk a little bit more about the assignments that we in just introduced as well. So now that we got backgrounds underway, what is the NOAA Corps? Well, of course, everybody here is familiar with NOAA, you know, one of the largest environmental or the largest environmental agency in the U.S. We've got about 13,000 employees, of course, mostly civilian. Uh, some folks don't realize that we actually have a uniform service. And we were recently just uh, reauthorized to grow our service from 321 commissioned officers up to 500. So we're doing that slowly and surely. Um, obviously, it takes time. And so we're currently about 330 um, authorized commissioned officers. Um, and bottom line, what do we do? Well, we assist NOAA's environmental and scientific missions operationally. And I know that's a, kind of a catch-all term, and we're going to totally dive inside a little bit more, but 
quite helpful to have a little bit of background of, of what a uniform service is. So um, a uniform service, uh, like other armed services, we serve the country under oath, uh, which entitles us to the same rights, privileges, and benefits as other services. Uh, the U.S. is made up of its six armed services. Everybody's familiar with them, the Army, the Navy, Coast Guard, Marines, Air Force, and now Space Force. And then we have two uniformed services, the U.S. Public Health Service, as well as the NOAA Commission Corps. As I mentioned, we've got about 330 officers right now. And unlike the other services, we do not have an enlisted corps. We're all officers. So our, our uh, ranks range from 01, which is ensign, that's our entry level position, all the way up to 08, which is Rear Admiral Admiral Hahn, our senior leadership. Um, we serve throughout all of NOAA's line offices. So no matter what line office you currently work in in NOAA or familiar with, you, you've probably at least heard of the NOAA Corps and, and most likely have worked with one of us as well. Uh, some of the requirements uh, you know, before we even apply, you must be a U.S. citizen and we do require all of our uh, applicants to have a bachelor's degree with at least 48 semester hours in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. The reason being is although we're more operationally based and, and operationally trained, we're still working with NOAA scientists, our academic partners as well, and international scientists. And so it's, it's helpful to have that STEM background that STEM, and that STEM uh, foundation so we can at least converse with our, our partners, converse with our customers in, in order to get the job done. Uh, we also uh, adhere to U.S. Coast Guard medical standards, so you must be able to pass that. You must be able to obtain a secret level security clearance, and as federal employees, we're subject to drug testing throughout our career. So enough about the background information. Let's dive uh, more into the specifics of the career. All Corps officers start off at the same place. We start off through our basic officer training class program. As Connor and I mentioned, we, we graduated together. We went through the program back in the fall of 2013. It's held at the U.S. Coast Guard Academy in New London, Connecticut, and it's completely assimilated and integrated with, with U.S. Coast Guard Officer Candidate School. The training itself is about five months long, and the best way to kind of equate it, uh, at least I, I do to the students that I talk to quite a bit, is, is it's another semester at school in the sense that each week there's a, a curriculum that you're, that you're going to be focusing in on academically, except our curriculum, we're going to be more practical stuff. It's going to be navigation, ship handling principles, basic seamanship, survival at sea, you're going to learn damage control and, um, and emergency preparedness techniques. You're also going to have the leadership training and military etiquette sprinkled in. And on top of the curriculum that we're going to have, we're going to be in class for, for up to eight hours a day. You're going to also have the physical training aspect. You're going to have the stressful environment. But you're also going to get a lot of uh, practical experience on the water, in simulators. You're going to have the chance to sail aboard uh, the U.S. Coast Guard Cutter Eagle, which you can see here pictured uh, on the left-hand side. That's a, a tall ship that the, the Coast Guard maintains as a training cutter. Uh, for, for its officer candidates, as well as its, its cadets going through the, the four-year program. And so um, you get to sell aboard that. You'll also get the opportunity to sell aboard uh, at least one or two NOAA research vessels as well. So you get a lot of, of real-world on-the-job experience. It's certainly a challenging, um, uh, challenging program, but one of the most rewarding. And you're making lifelong friends with not only your, your officer candidates within NOAA, but also your Coast Guard counterparts too. And in this slide, you can see a couple of photos of, of Connor and I's time aboard the Eagle, but on the right, that's our, our class there um, back in the fall 2013, probably getting ready for graduation and, and Connor and I are, are shoulder to shoulder in the, uh, the back left there. So pretty cool blast from the past. Um, so after uh, the BOTSI program, about, uh, let me back it up, about halfway through, officer candidates will have the opportunity to rank their preferences. And what I mean by that is they'll have an opportunity to kind of rank the next assignment that they want to go out and pursue. And so, as I mentioned before, we've got two kind of main career tracks in our, in our service. One is maritime and the other is aviation. Um, currently, we have about 15 ships sprinkled across 10 home ports. As you can see from this graphic, our ships are located everywhere from Oconus region in Alaska and Hawaii to the West Coast, Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic seaboard as well. We also have two new ships being built right now in Louisiana. Those will be online in the next two to three years. And one is earmarked for Hawaii and the other is earmarked for Rhode Island. Each ship kind of has its own geographic uh, operating area, its own uh, operating area that it maintains, and they also have their own missions. There is some cross collaboration uh, as far as missions go, but each ship is kind of distinctly uh, categorized either as a hydrographic survey vessel, a fisheries research vessel, or an oceanographic research vessel. And I'm certainly gonna dive into those a little bit in a little bit more detail. Uh, but just broadly speaking, these missions could include nautical charting, fisheries research, oceanographic research, coastal monitoring, and even ocean exploration. I'll turn it back over to Connor to talk about the aviation side. 
Sure. Thanks, Dustin. On the aviation side, we have nine aircraft that operate worldwide. The two you see on the left are our Hurricane Hunter aircraft, the Gulfstream G4, and below that, a WP-3D Orion. In the middle of the screen there on the top, there's a Twin Otter, which is the plane that I fly, and we have a King Air that's right in the middle of the screen. These aircraft operate all around the country, all around the world, supporting missions that you see at the bottom, whether that's hurricane hunting, hurricane reconnaissance and surveillance, charting and mapping, uh, taking imagery of the coastline and the bottom of the ocean, uh, marine mammal research, and various environmental assessments. All of our aircraft are based in Lakeland, Florida. We have a new facility that was built uh, a couple years ago, 2017, that you see in the picture there at the bottom. And the NOAA Corps officers are the pilots and the navigators that operate these particular aircraft. I think we can go to the next slide and get a little bit more detailed into the aircraft themselves, if you'd like. Maybe. Did we lose Dustin? Did we lose Dustin? <laughs> it looks like we possibly did. Okay, well, I can keep talking if you'd like, um, just from this slide alone. So the top aircraft you see there is the uh, NOAA Twin Otter. It supports uh, light aircraft uh, missions for NOAA, whether that's looking at whales and seals and dolphins and sea lions and things like that. Um, on the bottom, you have the uh, NOAA King Air, which is uh, supporting missions that look at the changing coastline. So uh, the remote sensing division looks at uh, how the coastline's changing. We map the bottom of the ocean. We'll do emergency response efforts. So I believe, if you can still see the screen, uh, the bottom right image there is actually the World Trade Center um, site post 9-11. And, and our aircraft flew over that site to take imagery and kind of direct, direct um, emergency response efforts after that uh, terrorist attack there. Um, we also do a project called Snow Survey, so flying at 500 feet over the ground, looking at the snowpack, and the National Weather Service is curious about that because they want to see what the flooding will be when the snow melts down season in the spring. Right here we have the uh, heavy aircraft as well. Um, these are kind of considered our hurricane hunting aircraft. On the top, there's the Gulfstream 4, um, which is a high-altitude reconnaissance jet. And on the bottom is a WP-3D Orion. We have two of those. And so these aircraft are flying in, around, above the storm environment itself to get a sense of the forecast track and forecast intensity of the storms. And again, our NOAA Corps pilots are the, uh, our NOAA Corps officers rather, are the pilots um, that fly these aircraft or the navigators that uh, navigate the planes. A fun fact about these that everyone seems to like is that all of our heavy aircraft are named after the Muppets. So, uh, the Petri Orions are named Miss Piggy and Kermit, uh, respectively, for the two of them. And then we have Gonzo with a long nose. It's our Gulfstream 4. With that, Dustin, it looks like you're back. I'll let you take it over from there. Cool. Thanks, Connor. I, I apologize for that, everybody. Of course, Murphy's Law. Um, things were going fine, and then my internet just uh, just dropped out. So. I hope everybody can hear me okay, and I'll take it back over. Thank you again, Connor, for, for running with it there for a few minutes. Um, so transitioning back to the maritime side of things. So a lot of folks ask, okay, I get it. You can either go maritime or you can go aviation. I totally understand what an aviator does. They fly the plane. Well, what does a mariner do? Well, similarly, we're trained to drive NOAA's fleet of, of 15 research vessels. And so that's our primary duty. We'll spend about eight hours a day on the bridge of the ship, uh, performing navigation, operations, making sure equipment's working uh, properly to get the job done. So scientists come to us, they've got research projects, um, say it could be they want to study an endangered species like the right whale. So they, they, they come to us, they write these, uh, these research proposals, they use our assets, our ships, to, and, and we take them out and help facilitate that science for, for weeks at a time. Um, on top of the eight hours of driving the ship, uh, each officer will maintain a series of collateral duties. These collateral duties can include anything from navigation officer to safety officer, it might be damage control officer, it might even be fun things like diving officer, morale officer, ship store officer. So we're all gonna wear a lot of different hats. And as you can probably see from the, the presentation thus far, that's, that's pretty common throughout any NOAA Corps officer's career. Um, but one thing is for certain, we're, we're providing that, that leadership and that support, uh, which is necessary for day-to-day -day operations. So I promised I'd talk a little bit more about each of the, 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 the types of vessels we have. First off is our oceanographic research vessels. 
Uh, these ships are, are multifaceted platforms uh, cap capable of conducting an array of uh, maritime sciences, whether it's uh, atmospheric research, uh, ocean chemistry research, they can do fisheries research, multi-beam mapping, uh, scuba diving operations, deployment and recovery of, of oceanographic buoys, and even uh, ocean ex exploration through remotely operated vehicles, which you see in the top left there. Um, my first assignment was aboard an oceanographic research vessel. I mentioned the NOAA ship Ron Brown, which is pictured in the top right corner there. Um, we do take the ship internationally quite a bit, uh, works international with a lot of our partners. And uh, during my first two years aboard, this is some of some of the tracks that we covered and some of the projects we worked on. So you can see the, the extent of ocean that we covered and some of the countries that we worked in. And, and this graphic doesn't even tell the full picture. Before I rotated off, we actually took the ship up uh, to the north slope of Alaska and into the Arctic ice, which was a pretty cool experience as well. So uh, that was a great ship to kind of cut my teeth on, uh, get a lot of sea days and, and get my experience as well as, you know, I, I've always loved travel. So uh, being able to go to some of these countries was, was really a unique opportunity that I'm thankful for. Uh, some photos from my time as well. Um, can't not include that photo on the top left. I mean, even though we were in port there in Hawaii, it was just too perfect of a picture. Uh, top right is the ship getting ready to go under the Golden Gate Bridge. I mentioned the oceanographic buoys that we maintain. That's a good photo of it in the bottom right there uh, of two of our um, scientists from PMEL working on, or even maybe in the National Data Buoy Center in Stennis, uh, working on a, a tau buoy, which is an equatorial buoy uh, in the Pacific. Uh, that's the brown, the bottom uh, center picture is the brown uh, departing in Honolulu. And the bottom left, um, sorry, it's a little grainy there, um, but that's a deployment of a, of a um, CTD which is a scientific piece of equipment that we use to, to do um, basically water quality, to measure water quality. Um, so the next type of ship we have is a fisheries research vessel. And these vessels, we've got them in the, in the, uh, on the Pacific coast, on the Gulf of Mexico, and as well as the Atlantic seaboard as well. And really what they're charged at uh, doing is understanding the physical and biological processes of our commercial fisheries industry. So we'll take scientists out and through various methodologies, we'll, we'll be able to create a profile and assess the health of a specific uh, fisheries uh, in one of our oceans. So whether that's the red snapper in the Gulf of Mexico or cod in the North Atlantic or um, uh, salmon out in the, in the Pacific, you know, these ships are, are kind of looking at those commercial fishing industries and using that data that we're collecting to set policy, whether it be commercial fish limits or um, Endangered Species Act as well. Uh, of course, they're not just going out there doing one specific study. They're also looking at habitat assessments, uh, surveying marine mammal and marine bird populations, and observing other environmental conditions. Now, on my second sea assignment, I sailed aboard a fisheries research vessel, so I got to work with the National Marine Fisheries Service down at the southeast lab in Pascagoula, Mississippi. I worked aboard the NOAA ship Gordon Gunter as ops officer, and as ops officer, uh, my main responsibility was kind of the liaison between the science party and the ship itself. So from conception of the project to execution at sea, I was the point person for the science group. Uh, and I really enjoyed that position because you got to work with, with academics who are really passionate about their, about their project and kind of uh, take their idea and, and make sure it was executed safely and successfully out at sea. We, uh, unlike the Brown, you know, we didn't go internationally. So we mainly sailed in the Gulf of Mexico and Atlantic Ocean. And as I mentioned, it was, it was mostly fisheries research. Um, and I think some of my favorite projects aboard that ship were uh, some of the projects we did with the Brutus whale, which is endangered species in the Gulf of Mexico. We did a lot of unmanned aerial photography with them. Um, and I enjoyed working with that group and kind of getting to understand how that technology works because I'm sure everybody aware that's, that's kind of the future and of some of the research that we do is unmanned systems. So that was kind of my first experience with, with unmanned aerial systems. And I look forward to continuing to, to learn more about that throughout my career. Uh, our last type of vessel is our hydrographic survey vessels. And uniquely enough, this is uh, what NOAA's work is, is actually rooted in, is um, understanding our coastlines and, and mapping and charting our, our ocean floors. So back in the 1800s, Thomas Jefferson recognized the importance to understanding our, our coastlines for, for com, uh, commerce purposes. He wanted to make sure that we were able to bring ships in and support our growing economy. And he then, um, at the time, we were the U.S. Coast and Geodetic Survey, and he tasked us with basically mapping our, our coastal environments and our ocean floors. And we used to do it with lead lines. So we'd bring out these small boats, and they would, you know, uh, with a, just hand over hand, they would uh, deploy a, a lead piece of lead on a string until they hit the bottom of the ocean floor, and, and they would mark out how deep it was and then move on to the next site. Obviously, that's tedious work, but nonetheless, that's kind of what we're rooted in, and we're still doing that today. So we currently have four hydrographic survey vessels which uh, are, are tasked with doing this. 
And so they work to, to map our ocean floors. And, and really this becomes important when you think about not only our, our commercial waterways, but also post-storm, post-natural disasters as well. We may not be taking our big white hold fleet into some of the nooks and crannies after a storm goes through, but we're gonna deploy some of our um, smaller small boats to, um, <clears throat> to actually get in there and, and do some of the uh, do some of the charting and the mapping just to make sure there's no obstructions or, or no issues uh, so we can get uh, supplies and, and, and emergency uh, relief in as necessary. And then I should, should mention too, what's unique about these vessels is unlike the fisheries and the oceanographic fleet where we bring scientists on board to, to conduct their operations, uh, we actually serve, we as the NOAA Corps, we serve as the, the quote unquote scientists for these hydrographic ships as well. So the, the officers assigned to these vessels are, will actually be the ones that are going out, collecting the data and doing the data processing necessary to, to make that raw data into the nautical charts that we see today. Um, so I've talked a lot about the, um, the, the fleet uh, thus far, but one thing that's unique too for, for mainly for maritime officers, but, but I know it's possible on the aviation side is you have the opportunity to go out and, and pursue qualifications in diving. And NOAA has its own NOAA diving program uh, that's based in Seattle, Washington. So no matter where you come in on the spectrum as far as uh, interest or prior experience with diving in the, in the private sector or recreationally, uh, we're gonna send you to dive school. So if you're interested in doing it, we can certainly make it happen, but you're still gonna go to, to day one of dive school. And um, we have various qualifications, which includes NOAA diver, NOAA working, or excuse me, NOAA dive master. And then um, uh, further, you can do re, uh, rebreather, technical diving. You can also do dive uh, medical uh, training as well. So it's certainly a qualification that you can maintain throughout your career and build on. And it opens up quite a lot of, quite a few doors for you, quite a few assignments throughout your career. Um, and so just some of these duties that are listed here include wreckage recovery, research assistance, and ship maintenance or hole inspections. We've got some photos here of, of some NOAA core divers and uh, top photo looks like uh, divers getting ready to, to probably splash doing a ship husbandry dive on one of our, our research vessels. Uh, bottom left looks like dive training at uh, the NOAA dive center there in Seattle. And uh, the right photo is, is always a good one. It's a NOAA core diver hanging on to the propeller of the ship. And, and don't worry, the, the propeller is not on, but just kind of gives you an, uh, an idea of, of what our ship husbandry dive might be. You know, you can think about it if, if a ship's out at sea and, and we get something stuck in the propeller and, and we, you know, it's, it's too far to limp home to, to get it repaired. What's an easy fix? Well, we can send the dive team down to see if they can dislodge whatever's, whatever has wrapped itself around the prop. So I've talked a lot about the operational side. Both Connor and I have the aviation and the maritime side of the house. Um, we augment those with shore side assignments. So like all services, we rotate. We do about two years on the maritime side at sea assigned to one of our research vessels and then we'll do three-year shore assignments. As I mentioned in one of the beginning slides, these shore assignments are, uh, will serve throughout all the line offices of NOAA. You can see those graphics to the right there. Um, and it, it's kind of unique. We have a lot of autonomy in our career, uh, probably more so than other services, just due to the nature of the size of our service, you know, being about 330 officers, we really get to know one another and we get to know each other's interests and strengths. And you can use those to kind of parlay them into a, a career. And so you might pursue assignment because you want to work specifically for the National Ocean Service like I did in, in a sanctuary program, or excuse me, a sanctuary assignment. Or you might be, you might have a background in meteorology and atmospheric sciences, and you really wanna work for the National Hurricane Center or for one of our weather service offices. And you can certainly pursue that and try to make it happen. There's really two things, um, two variables, in my opinion, that <clears throat> kind of um, help um, define a, a no core officer's pursuit of a shore assignment. First one being just their interest, you know, where they want to work and, and what they want to do. And number two is the geographic area as well. Uh, I look at that as one of the, the, the huge um, bonuses of our career, just opportunity to get to, to move around and live in unique places of the country. And so it's something I, you know, me and my wife always think about when, and when we're looking at new assignments is, hey, where do we want to live? Where do we want to take our next steps? That kind of stuff. So um, with those two variables in mind, you can kind of pursue an assignment, um, you know, internally and, and, and try to make it happen. Um, and what, what's cool about our assignments too is that, uh, or about our careers, I should say, is that officers, uh, two officers will, will really never have the same career path. Even if they're both maritime officers or both aviators, uh, likely their shore assignments are going to take them to different places, working for different line offices, and they're going to have a totally different experience. So it's pretty cool to, to have such a unique service where everybody kind of has their own unique career as well. But one thing's for, for certain, we're going to provide that technical, operational, and managerial expert, expertise to all facets of NOAA. 
And uh, my one land assignment uh, I've had before I, I wrote to the, up here to the recruiting branch was at the was at Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary uh, down in Galveston, Texas. And there I served as the vessel operations coordinator for the 84 foot research vessel Manta, which is pictured there in those two photos. Um, as a vessel operations coordinator, I wore a lot of different hats. Uh, mainly, I was responsible for everything uh, related to that that small boat. So whether it was overseeing the crew of four managing projects and schedules and budget and repairs, uh, to even going out as a research diver, uh, which was some of my um, most fond memories, I was able to accomplish that. And we'd sail about anywhere for about 60 to 80 days per year. So I was able to maintain my operational qualifications and also even gain some more, especially on the diving side of things. Um, and then predominantly we were doing coral reef research. So again, you can kind of see the breadth of my career, whether it was working on the Brown or, or flower garden banks doing coral reef research or fisheries research, I, I've had a little bit of taste of, of everything thus far, which has been, been awesome. And these last few slides here are just a collection of photographs uh, from various colleagues out in the fleet, uh, both on the maritime and the aviation side of the house, um, just kind of depicting our career. You know, at the top left, you see a buoy deployment in the, in the middle, you know, it's not all roses when you're at life at sea. It's not all glassy, calm water. You're certainly going to encounter um, uh, rough weather from time to time. Uh, top right is, is uh, looks like an officer enjoying some R and R with one of the ship's sea kayaks there. Um, bottom right, you'll see uh, a photo steaming away, probably from a, a um, uh, mountain range there, and I would imagine that's in Alaska. Uh, and, and bottom left, uh, Connor, correct me if I'm wrong, that's probably a, a twin otter pilot, um, J C Clark, right? Looking yep, good. So. He's flying awesome. in Alaska as well. Very cool. Uh, so these are some small boat photos from various small boats in the fleet. Uh, that's a Gloria Michelle, which is based out of Woods Hole, Massachusetts. So a lot of these uh, photos are from New England in various um, conditions and, and operating areas. Some more um, photos from our fleet, a hydrographic survey, top left. Uh, you see a small boat gearing up for a, probably a Christmas parade, I'd imagine. Uh, bottom right, either a sunrise or a sunset off a of NOAA ship. Um, bottom left, that's one of my photos. That's the ROV command center on the on the Ron Brown. We're doing some ROV work off the coast of Oregon. Uh, we do have one built that's that's very popular within our ranks. It's a uh, uh, you basically get to serve for a year as the Antarctica station chief down at the geographic South Pole. So you get to winter over there with a team of scientists. Um, Definitely, definitely a, a very unique and challenging assignment, but one that, that everyone speaks fairly highly of. And I'll turn it over to Connor if you want to describe some of these aviation photos. Sure, yeah, these are a few photos that I've compiled over the last uh, four years or so. This is the Twin Otter again. This is the plane that I fly. Um, it's pretty amazing. You know, on this plane, I've gone everywhere from New York Harbor, circling the Statue of Liberty, looking for marine mammals in New York Harbor to Alaska, that's in the top right. Um, we were doing a project looking for stellar sea lions there. The bottom right is a mom calf North Atlantic right whale. The right whale is an endangered species, so we spent a lot of time tracking uh, that particular mammal, um, usually based out of Cape Cod or sometimes St. Simon's, Simon's Island in Georgia. In the bottom left there is a colleague and I, uh, Lieutenant Mason Carroll. We, um, we're on that snow survey project, so 500 feet over the ground looking at uh, the water content of the snowpack that's in Minneapolis. So uh, just on this one platform, you know, traveling uh, all over the world, all over the country is a pretty cool uh, opportunity that the NOAA Corps has provided to me. On the next slide, we have a uh, slew of pictures from our heavy aircraft. So uh, top left, bottom right is our, and the bottom left as well as our P3 Orion aircraft. Uh, top left fly flying through a hurricane. We do that 24 seven when a storm um, arrives and we'll forward deploy our aircraft to um, kind of get information as it's nearing the uh, US coast. Uh, the bottom left there is uh, an air show that any aviators might be familiar with. It's called Oshkosh or EAA Air Venture. It's in Wisconsin and uh, Admiral Sila, one of the former admirals from NOAA is standing with our crew there. And then in the top right, is our uh, trustworthy G4 pilots, one of our crews uh, flying clearly during COVID. Um, you know, during COVID, our operations didn't stop. We still uh, were traveling and uh, deploying our crews uh, for hurricane surveillance missions. So that's kind of a taste of the light and heavy aircraft. Back to you, Justin. Thank you, Connor. And that concludes all of our slides for now. So of course, we'd like to open up for questions. 
Great. Thank you so much, Connor and Dustin. We have a bunch of questions. Uh, so I'm going to flip back to the beginning of your presentation talking about qualifications. So you mentioned uh, you do have to have a bachelor's degree to qualify as an applicant, and that includes at least 48 credit hours in a STEM area, correct? That is correct, yes. Okay, so the follow-up question is, are there opportunities for an officer to complete an advanced degree that would be uh, supplemented or paid for by the you know, Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. Um, so one thing, one of, the, one of the big benefits of our service is we're entitled to the, the Montgomery and the post-911 GI bills. And some of you might be familiar with those. For those who aren't, um, basically what they are in a nutshell is they're, they're eight years of additional tuition um, opportunities paid for by, for by the government for uh, U.S. service members. And they are transferable, at least one of them is transferable to dependents as well. So for spouse or kids, you can pass those down the line as well. And it's, um, it's very common for officers to go out and, and seek uh, additional education. And in fact, it's in, encouraged and, and considered um, part of our job to, to be continuous learners. But you'll see often that um, officers will go out and, and seek a, uh, additional education throughout their career. Speaking from experience, I went out and got a master's degree during my uh, land assignment there. But you see officers, in, and mine was in marine science, um, and MS, but you see a lot of officers go out and look at MPAs or even MBAs. Um, we also have uh, three distinct billets in our service where we're sending you to school for full, uh, full time. Two of them are at UNH, and then one of them is actually at the uh, Kennedy School of Business at Harvard as well. Um, so it's, it's and, and Noah will pay for those directly. You won't have to use your GI bill. Um, so if you do it on your own time, you know, you're absolutely encouraged to do so and, and, and kind of use that GI Bill um, that's, that's available for you. Um, but you can also go out and seek the, the permanent assignments that they're sending you to school full time as well. Great, thanks. Uh, this is one of my questions. Uh, can the NOAA Corps uh, folks, can they switch between these two tracks, between uh, the Marine and Aviation? And out of those uh, 300 so officers, what's the proportion between the two? Connor, you want to take that? Sure. Um, so the answer is yes. So for example, I started out as a mariner. I did a, my initial sea tour on the NOAA ship Nancy Foster, and then I applied to the flight program and I was accepted there. Um, once you're in the flight program, most of the folks stay in the flight program. It's kind of, you're kind of on that track now, um, but we often take selections from the fleet uh, to move to flight, uh, but it's not common to move back necessarily. As far as the split's concerned, we have about 45 active pilots of the 330 um, officers or so. Thanks. Uh, next question, are there any NOAA civilian positions that work directly with NOAA Corps? I believe this would be, a, I don't wanna say an obvious yes, but there are a lot of folks in OMAO that work closely with operations and NOAA Corps, correct? <laughs> yeah, that's great. I'll cover that um, from the aircraft side, at least. So, you know, to get these planes in the air, we rely on a, a team of mechanics. We rely on a team of, um, uh, you know, support staff. Uh, on the hurricane hunters, we have meteorologists. We have uh, specialists, the guys that are actually throwing the instruments outside of the aircraft itself. Those are all civilian uh, employees, federal NOAA employees. Um, on the marine side as well, we work with uh, you know deckhands and uh, engineers that are all civilian, um, and so it's a it's a harmonious relationship uh, that moves forward um, uh, to support no emissions. Thanks, Connor. I do have a few more questions that I think I can throw your way. Uh, Dustin, I sure. think, has lost his internet again, but yeah. we have some questions for you. How deep can the aerial surveys do seabed mapping compared to the hydrographic vessels? That is a good question, and I should have that number a little bit more readily, but um, most of our uh, coastal mapping efforts from the aircraft are in kind of shallow waters, if you will. So you know, 50 meters or so or below, that might even be a little bit deeper than, than, uh, than we want. Um, but so the, so the aircraft kind of handle the near shore efforts and then the, the uh, small boats and NOAA ships handle the offshore efforts. Great, uh, another aircraft question. Uh, do you know the sure. history of why the heavy aircraft is named after Muppet characters? I sure do. I'm glad someone asked that question. So um, the, 
T3, uh, 40, Noah 43 is uh, Miss Piggy. And she got that name because um, at the time she was moving really slowly. There were some mechanical problems. And one of our, our lead mechanic, Greg Bast, actually decided to call her the pig. And uh, sure enough, that name stuck. Uh, they cleaned the aircraft up. It became one of our best performing aircraft. And if she was Miss Piggy, then Miss Piggy obviously had to have a partner, which was Kermit. Uh, so Kermit and Miss Piggy were acting together for hurricane efforts. And then if we got the jet, which we did in, in uh, the, the 90s, we needed to get uh, Gonzo as well involved. Gonzo has the big nose, as you might be familiar with. And uh, our aircraft, the G4, has a large nose as well, which is where our radom is. So the three of those, uh, Miss Piggy, Gonzo, and uh, Kermit, all support our hurricane efforts. Thanks. That was a very good question. Um, I have a question. So you say you are flying low and slow up uh, about 500 feet. Are there any restrictions for you where you have to be in certain areas or uh, can't go certain places because of that height? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so we comply with all FAA rules in terms of minimum safe altitudes. Um, most of our efforts are so for the Marine Mammal Service looking at whales, they are you know, offshore. So that's generally 600 to 1,000 feet. Uh, the project that I'm supporting right now, um, which is called Snow Survey, as discussed, is at 500 feet. We get a special waiver from the FAA that says that we can go um, a little bit lower, um, provided that we you know, watch out for obstacles and always have a, an emergency plan uh, in action in case something goes wrong. Great, thanks. Uh, we have another flight question. Would uh, the flight program provide, it seems like you, you do provide um, on uh, pilot training, but are flight officers expected to already have previous flight experience? No, not necessarily. So when I joined the aviation program, I had zero flight time effectively. I had it like a maybe a two hour or three hour introductory flight, but um, we will take people with no flight time. We will take people with some flight time. Um, it kind of depends on the needs of the service at the time. So um, obviously it's, you know, it's, it bodes in your interest if you're interested um, to have a little bit of flight time um, when you apply, but it's not necessarily a requirement. Great, and I can thanks. expand on that mm -hmm. question too. Um, we mm -hmm. take folks, as I said, from the fleet, from um, the Marine side to fly our aircraft, but we also take folks uh, from other services. So we have an inter-service transfer program um, I have colleagues that have flown P3 Orions in the Navy. I have friends that have flown for the Coast Guard and the Marines and things like that. So uh, we tap on their flight training and their experiences to help contextualize our, our uh, aviation operations. Great, thanks. Since uh, Dustin is still uh, offline, I'm gonna ask one or two more questions and hope he can get back on. How far okay. out in advance are your aviation schedules set? Um, that's a good question. So we have a um, an annual allocation plan, an air aircraft allocation plan that's decided every year, and this applies for the ship side as well. They have a fleet allocation plan. So every fiscal year, all the line offices get together and do they decide what aircraft will be operating um, on what projects and when. So uh, we have a set, um, generally speaking, for the year, we have a set uh, schedule for the aircraft, and the same applies for the ships. Uh, what can change in there is, um, you know, line office can negotiate with each other about time a little bit, and we um, uh, can alter the schedule a little bit, for, but for the most part, it's it's pretty fixed. Great. Okay, this is more of a training beginning uh, your your career. How common is it for a security clearance application to be rejected? And when and if that happens, at what point in your officer's training does that occur? Um, that is a good question. Dustin, I don't know if you heard that. Um, I will I let did. you take that one. Yeah, I did. And I apologize, everybody. I don't know what is going on with my computer today, but it just keeps kicking me out. But I'm back. And I did hear that last question. Um, so as far as the security clearance in my tenure, albeit short, I have never seen anyone be uh, denied a security clearance. Um, and that includes folks with like misdemeanor um, history. Um, I wouldn't say like a lot of that, but maybe like one or two, uh, as long as you're honest and, and you know, you've kind of paid, paid whatever, you know, fines or whatever you had to deal with, you can, you can get through that. 
Um, but nonetheless, I, I've never seen anybody not get a security clearance if they've applied for it. Uh, but I know in the past people have been rejected for it. Um, and as far as the timeline goes about, you know, when, when do they apply for that? So that will uh, come after the application cycle. Uh, once they've been selected as either a primary or an alternate candidate, um, that's when we would then send them to what we call our extension program, which includes uh, background screening for the security clearance as well as uh, physical um, uh, for the Coast Guard uh, physical and the um, uh, drug screening as well. So that would all happen uh, after selection process as they're going through the ascension process. Thanks, Dustin. I did have a question for you. Um, you okay. mentioned that the specific ships that do the hydrographic mapping, uh, the yep. crew is actually doing taking those measurements and doing doing the science. Um, yep. Do you have to have a specific background to serve on those ships, or is there yeah, additional that's training? A, that's a great question. Uh, there is no specific background, although there are some degrees that'll set you up for um, maybe more of an interest in that career path. Um, that being said, there is a lot of uh, initial training that you'll go through, and that's something that's common throughout your career. You're going to have a lot of opportunity to, uh, for trainings uh, and various qualifications. But if you do go the hydrographic route, we'll send you to what we call hydro school, probably very quickly within that sea tour, uh, ideally within the first couple of months um, to get you acclimated to the software that you'll be using and the operations that you'll be undertaking in order to make those nautical charts. And from my understanding, that, that class is about a month long or so. Um, so we'll send you to that that hydro school um, before getting you back out uh, in order to to help the ship and 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 be a you know a productive member of the crew. Thanks. Uh, next question: Can you speak to the future of air and ocean monitoring, specifically with unmanned systems or uncrewed systems? Is the NOAA Corps training folks in drone piloting and navigation, uh, both for air drones and underwater? Yeah, we we can probably tag team this a little bit, Connor. I'll, I'll speak broadly about it. Um, we are setting up an unmanned systems um, arm right now. It's going to be based out of out of Mississippi, and and yes, we are we are moving that direction. We have currently have quite a few billets that are going in that direction as well, and, and uh, officers have the opportunity to earn unmanned system qualifications. And like I said, that that department's standing up that branch, and, and so I expect a lot more resources for both personnel, research, and funding to be headed in that direction as well. And I know aviation, uh, Dana AOC Connor, you guys already kind of have a program in place, correct? Yeah, we have a UAS, UAS uh, division uncrewed systems at um, AOC that support, you know, a wide variety of um, projects for NOAA for many different line offices. So that, I think that's definitely on our radar and definitely something we're moving toward in the future. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, so next question, how hard is it to get the opportunity to go to dive school? Yeah, Connor, you were a diver, correct, as well? I was, yep, and um, it was a, a need that the ship needed at the time, and I was the right guy to go. Um, it's kind of how it worked for me. I don't know how it worked for you, Dustin. Yeah, similar story as well. Before I reported to my first ship, the executive officer who kind of oversees personnel, uh, you know, said, hey, you're interested in going to dive school. We've got a need for a diver. I said, yep, let's do it, and they sent me to dive school even before I reported to the ship. Uh, that being said, it's not a super competitive process just might take a little bit of time for you to get there. If you're interested and you make your intentions known to your executive officer upon reporting to your first command, uh, they're gonna do everything in their, in, that's in their powers to basically get you there. The good thing about having a NOAA dive program internally to NOAA itself is they do offer three training sessions per year. Generally speaking, one in, in, one in the winter in January, one in May, and then one in, in late summer around September. So there's ample opportunities to, to head to one of those classes. Um, and, and it's kind of like a rite of passage the way, at least I look at it for ensigns, uh, that entry level rank uh, to be able to go to dive school if they so desire to. Great. Uh, so there is a question about uh, if you could talk more broadly about As Alaska since uh, someone was uh, based up there and they just wanted to hear more about uh, taking ice and sea observations. Yeah, I can speak about that. I know my operations that brought me out there, and maybe Connor, you can talk about the aviation side. Uh, was when I was on the Brown, uh, we did two projects that brought us up to Alaska. The first, we were just doing uh, typical like ocean chemistry studies uh, and and kind of environmental data studies, just real basic stuff in the Gulf of Alaska and the Southeast Alaska. So we uh, it was actually a beautiful project. It was in the August of 2015, I want to say, and uh, so we worked in Southeast Alaska. 
uh, kind of in and out of the inside passage there up to Kodiak. And then we uh, did a crew change, brought in new scientists for another project, which brought us uh, up through the Aleutian chain into the Bering Sea. And then, as I mentioned, uh, into the, the above the North Slope into the Arctic ice. And what we were doing then was, um, I don't know if you remember politically at the time, back in 2015, there was um, interest in drilling up in there. And so they brought us as well as another NOAA ship uh, up there to kind of get a baseline ecosystem data. There was a couple other federal partners up there, the, the Coast Guard mainly. And what we were doing is we were trying to get baseline ecosystem data, you know, kind of before drilling operations began. Uh, so that way in the event of like a spill or a disaster of that sort, we kind of had a, a good idea of what the ecosystem was like beforehand. So we're all kind of doing various different projects up there. We're up there for about three or four weeks uh, in August and September of 2015 as well. Um, so that's kind of my extent with Alaska operations from the maritime side. I do know that we've got um, a few ships that spend quite a bit of their summers up there, mostly hydrographic, both the fair weather and the rainier, generally speaking, most of the time go up to Alaska. The no ship Oscar Dyson also does a lot of fisheries research up in the Bering Sea too. So we have quite a few maritime assets that spend quite a bit of their uh, field seasons up, up in Alaska. And from the aviation side, we have uh, extensive operations in Alaska on the Twin Otter in the summertime, kind of like April through September, generally speaking. So that could uh, include uh, kind of Southeast Alaska, looking at stellar sea lions and seals, as well as along the Aleutian chain. We'll go all the way out to um, uh, Adak and Shemya. We'll send a plane out there, which is kind of an exciting opportunity for our pilots. We also do an Arctic heat project um, out in the Chukchi Sea, uh, looking at kind of the air sea interactions. We drop a series of uh, buoys that, that uh, can profile the water column and kind of tell scientists about the ecosystems out there. And we did a, a project recently called Jobs um, that was uh, a kind of a wide scale environmental assessment that included a uh, study of polar bears um, up in the Alaska region. So um, that's just one of the uh, many, uh, or actually a few of the many uh, projects that we do in Alaska on the light aircraft alone. <clears throat> uh, Connor, I'll mention too, we, we do have a few land assignments based out of Alaska too. So if you're interested in, in Alaska, somewhere where you wanna you know, pursue career opportunities, they're definitely available for you in the Corps. Great, thanks. I'm gonna combine two questions. Uh, the first one is uh, on sea missions for Dustin, generally how long do you spend on the boat before returning to shore? And secondly, <laughs> how do you officers, crew, scientists stay entertained while at sea? Uh, is there any good poker or ping pong tournaments? Yeah, that's a great question and actually surprisingly very, very important. Uh, crew morale, scientist morale is huge at ship. So let's answer the first question. The missions will range. Um, and so generally speaking, uh, fisheries research vessels, probably about two to three weeks at sea per project. Oceanographic research vessels, these are our, our kind of our class A vessels, a little bit larger. Um, so they might be spending a little bit more time at sea. The Ron Brown, the Okanis Explorer, they could be going up for 45 days, 50 days at a time. Generally speaking, three to four weeks for a project is, is not uncommon for those bigger platforms. The Nancy Foster, which is oceanographic, probably looking more about two weeks or so, maybe three weeks at a time. Uh, and then our hydrographic survey vessels, they're a little bit shorter, probably two, two to three weeks at a time as well for, for their uh, missions. Um, and then we'll come in. The oceanographic research vessels, because they have longer durations, they're gonna have a little bit longer turnaround time uh, during their field seasons when they're in port. So, you know, for example, when I was on the Brown, we would come in for, you know, maybe a week, 10 days at a time before turning back around and going out during our field seasons. Uh, those fisheries research vessels, hydrographic ves uh, survey vessels, during their field seasons, they're pretty quick, two, three day turnarounds, you know, resupply, crew turnout, turnout, scientist turnover, and then get back out there as, as necessary. Um, and then for, as far as morale at sea goes, yeah, that, uh, I mean, even in my two sea assignments, I've seen an incredible like, improvement on that. So whatever your interests are, there's stuff for you. So first off, we do have internet at sea. It's not as fast, I mean, it's probably better than my internet here today, but um, it's, it's not as fast as you would have in the office or at home, but you can basically get email, you can browse the internet. You can even, if you have an iPhone or you can do iMessage to iMessage. So uh, there's definitely capabilities to stay in touch with, with loved ones back at home, which is great. Uh, as far as like present on the ship, what you can do, you know, a lot of ships will have libraries, they'll have uh, morale events just about weekly, whether it's you know, like a poker night, like you mentioned, or bingo. I know some ships do have ping pong tables and we'll do ping pong tournaments. I, I know the Brown does that quite a bit. Um, and then all the ships also have a gym. 
Some are a little bit um, better than others, but I know senior leadership and NOAA was really big on, on promoting you know, mental and physical health these past couple of years and has earmarked money for the ships to improve their gym. So even if they're not you know, a huge amount of space, they definitely have nice new equipment, which is good. Um, and then there's just, you know, just general downtime for chit chatting, whether it's on the mess decks or in the lounge areas and, and ships that, that don't go um, too far away from the coastlines uh, will often have satellite internet capability, excuse me, satellite um, direct TV capabilities as well. Um, so they'll be able to get uh, pretty much a whole list of channels. Um, and with morale funds, you know, ships will, will buy certain packages, whether it be Sunday NFL ticket or a movie package or something like that, whatever the crew is kind of interested in, they'll use those morale funds from maybe the ship store to go out and Im improve the, the quality of life where they can. So it really just depends on what your interests are. <laughs> Thanks, Dustin. Uh, turning that over to aviation, how long is your, uh, your deployments and uh, how much time uh, away are you? That is a really good question, and it changes based on what aircraft you're assigned to. So um, I'm on the Twin Otter, as I said, and uh, we call ourselves, uh, you know, the Road Warriors, if you will. We, we give it an award every year for the people that are, are TDY um, that is uh, deployed um, the most, and I think I won that two years in a row a couple years ago. Um, so in general, about 200 days, 210 days a year. Um, is what I've kind of experienced. So that's seven months a year. Um, but you're kind of moving around. You're you're changing uh, what projects you're on. You're changing what planes you're on. You're changing the people you fly with. So um, that changed a little bit for our heavy aircraft. So um, our heavy aircraft have a few uh, winter projects when they're not doing the hurricane hunting mission that they'll deploy for maybe a month or so. But in the hurricane season, that is uh, now mid-May to November, um, we are kind of waiting for hurricanes to happen and we'll deploy our crews for maybe somewhere between a few days and maybe 10 days uh, at a time. Great, thanks. Uh, is there a maximum age for starting the BOTC for NOAA Corps? Uh, there's no maximum age, but uh, in our directives, it states that uh, by age 62, we will separate you regardless of your retirement status. So one of the big benefits we have is that 20 year retirement that service members are, um, that service members have, uh, excuse me, service members have. Um, and so, you know, age 42, if you have no prior service background might be kind of the, that, that cutoff year, but you know, we won't, we won't say no if you apply after, it's just a personal decision at that point. Great, thank you. Okay, we are running close to time. So I'm going to ask what has been your coolest deployment or experience? Oh, that is a, that's a very good question. Um, there, there are quite a few for me. Um, I, I think some of my favorite projects were probably early on in my career working on the Brown, just doing some of the international work we did. We did a lot of atmospheric sciences and, and climate change work, which I, I felt like really impacted our economy and some of the decision-making our policymakers were making, which I was, I was really proud of. I think the most fun assignments, I, fun, fun uh, projects I ever had was certainly my time at Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary. I have very fond memories, as I mentioned there, spending my summers on the Manta doing dive operations, small boat operations. So uh, those, those two uh, were probably my answer. Uh, for me, I don't have one that comes to mind, but I do have a period of time where I, in the course of one summer a few years ago, I went from mapping the bottom of the ocean, the Florida Keys, to like the next week tracking the North Atlantic right whale in Canadian waters, um, kind of north of Prince Edward Island, to uh, later that month over in Kodiak, Alaska, flying around looking for stellar sea lions, to later that summer uh, flying through forest fire smoke and in, in, from Boise, Idaho, down to the, the Grand Canyon area. So um, I have uh, kind of a large collection of pictures and a large collection of memories from all of those uh, deployments. Um, but I think long story short, you know, just to wrap it up, the NOAA Corps has provided me a, a slew of opportunities and I really just haven't looked back and I look forward to the adventures uh, down the road. Thank you both. Last question. What would you recommend for current NOAA employees interested in the Corps and can you be contacted for further questions? Uh, yeah, as a recruiting officer, step into my office, please. Uh, no, I always say this, if you're interested, let's have a conversation. Let's sit down. We'll be realistic with you. Uh, you can be honest with us where you are in your, your, your life and, and where do you see yourself moving forward. And we can provide real life uh, response if, if the no core is a good fit for you. I mean, obviously, Connor and I have kind of given our, 
our experiences and we've uh, very much enjoyed our career thus far. Uh, but we'll sit down and look at your situation and be and be real with you and, and see if it's a good fit. But um, it doesn't hurt to to reach out to us, and I can certainly provide my contact information after this if the um, after this uh, presentation if you are interested in having further discussion. Yeah, and likewise, I I am open um, if people are interested in the core or aviation. I'm happy to talk with folks, and I would recommend if you're interested to to seek out no core officers and ask them about their personal experiences and uh, about their adventures, the good and the bad, you know, is it all sunset pictures, for example? Uh, the answer is no, but uh, there's a lot of good that happens in the NOAA Corps. Thank you both. We've uh, gotten some kudos, some shout outs from the Flower Banks Garden, or Flower Garden <laughs> Banks, so sorry. Um, awesome. And a compliment on the mustache, Dustin. So uh, yes. we are. I, got, I was on leave last week, so I got an early start on No Shape November and just rolled right into November. <laughs> this, uh, this happened for me. Uh, thank, the, thank you to the audience for all of your great questions. Uh, we are going to end this now. If I did not get to your question, I will be sending them to Connor and Dustin, and they can reach out to you uh, via email to answer any lingering questions. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you again, Connor and Dustin. This was super informative about the NOAA Corps, and I am very excited uh, to learn more as we go. Uh, I see that. Uh, we have an email address. I'm going to pop that in for the whole audience to read and then also a phone number. So if folks are quick and grab those off the chat, I will uh, I will end our presentation here. Thank you, everyone. Have a safe and healthy rest of your Thursday. Awesome. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, everyone. See ya.